pray that this is the last um, opportunity for fellowship this couple of days. I have um, enjoyed them all both tremendously. It's been a great privilege for us both, my wife and myself, to be with you. We've been especially helped by Larry and the group in the singing. This is something not new but different. And um, it's wonderful to see it all based in, on scripture and a real worship in music. We've gone a bit wild that way in Britain in many areas and um, we could do with Larry's group coming over and uh, just teaching us how about that. <laughs> all expenses paid by you of course. <laughs> Don and Jean and you all and others would come. It would be so thrilling. A church at which we attend at St. John's in Birmingham is a church of England and uh, the vicar, the minister, is a tremendous fellow, thoroughly liberated in spirit. We have a midweek service that is called Open to God begins with a time of worship and praise, much as you do, and then a time of intercession and prayer for people who speak of any particular needs, and a time of real waiting on God, and then there's a time when we're open to God and open to each other, and people move around, and if there's broken fellowship, or um, misunderstanding, it's dealt with individually, personally. Little groups meet for prayer together. And then it followed, all followed by a real exposition from Scripture. It begins about just before eight and finishes well after ten. And um, it's a great meeting. And we just could do with some more of this type of um, worship that you have here. I don't know how I could introduce it. <laughs> My efforts at introducing the chorus are not too successful. <laughs> However, maybe you'll all come one day and see us. You just love to experience a, a winter in Britain. <laughs> and uh, you just enjoy the fellowship. And we would love to have you. Thank you so much for being so patient with a British accent, and thank you so much for your attentive, keen listening. We're tremendously impressed with the potential of this place. It's terrific. It's a seal upon, I'm sure, upon Don's ministry and Jean, and others too. And uh, we thank God for it. We shall constantly be thinking of you and praying for you. Of course, the work like this is open to attack from the enemy. If the Holy Spirit is really getting into bless, Satan's on the attack all the time. And we need to frame protection through the blood of Jesus. And know you will. Now, just to call us together, um, thank you, God, for sending us. stand and sing that. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you can. Holy Spirit, won't you teach me more about His lovely men standing just for a moment of quiet prayer, thanking the Lord for all 
all he means to each one of us, and praying that we may today appropriate all of Jesus, that he may live through us, and his life may be expressed in us. for thy servant here speak just now some message to meet my need which thou only dost know speak now through thy holy word and make me see some wonderful truth thou hast to show to me for Jesus sake Amen please be seated <clears throat> Hmm. I should perhaps have just said to you that um, we shall be around for the rest of this month in various Calvary chapels looking forward so much to it we'll be at Harvest and Costa Mesa and then we're going up to Northern California just to visit relatives for a couple of, couple of days and uh, we shall be at Redlands at the end of the month and then we move across to Chicago Moody Church again to preach there and at the Institute and then finally for a week with Billy Graham and the team at their annual retreat in Phoenix a place called Carefree sounds terrific <laughs> <laughs> and uh, looking forward to that and then back home again in uh, <clears throat> the middle of November. We would appreciate your prayers for God's grace and his sustaining strength. We are staying, you probably know, with Don and Jean. The only trouble about that house is that there's only one meal a day, but it lasts all day. <laughs> And I find I'm putting on weight, <laughs> which is uh, it's really tremendous. There's a zoo there, you probably know, and, um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm learning to get victory over snakes. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Christian friendship, Christian love. You know, you know, as you get older. And uh, these folks and you all mean so much to us. Thank you. Now to business. Um, Ezekiel 47, I think we'll stay with. And let me read again a few verses from the chapter we read last night. shared some thoughts on the subject of preparation for the ministry and the pattern for the ministry. And last night we began to think about power in the ministry, the power of the Spirit of God. And then, just to say the repetition, we'll read from uh, verse 6 of Ezekiel 47. He said to me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the bank of the river. Now, when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down to the desert and go into the sea, sea which being brought forth into the sea the waters shall be healed or shall be made fresh 
And then it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed. And everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Enigram. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But the Maori places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the river, upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees to meet, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his month, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine, or as the margin has it here, for bruises and sores. That's the word of the Lord. Now we're thinking of them. Um, this picture of the river as a picture of life in the spirit and concentrating on Ezekiel's vision. In just a moment to recapitulate, we saw the energy of the river, its source, the throne of God. Its course, the cross. The course, waters to swim in without any human earthly tributary. And then we talked about the experience of the river's depth, ankle deep, picture of carnality, knee deep, a picture of heart hunger. Line deep, a picture of new strength, and waters to swim in, a life totally committed to the Lord, a life in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, an essential experience for all of us because we cannot live or do a thing without Him. Now today, for them to think about the effect of the river's flow. There should always be, inevitably, evidence in the life of a man who is filled with the Spirit. Do you remember that on the day of Pentecost, the crowd asked, two questions. The first, what does all this mean? The second, men and brethren, what shall we do? There was something had happened in the lives of the disciples that needed explanation. And having received the explanation in the message from Peter, what shall we do? The explanation demanded a verdict. We can't expect people to keep on asking what are we going to do about Jesus unless we have something to explain something about us that can only be explained by miracle. And um, this is what we're talking about today. 
the miracle of a spirit-filled life. The inevitable evidences in the life of a man or a woman filled with the Spirit of God. It's um, a Methodist minister of whom I don't afraid you won't have heard that I, I realize is bad. I shouldn't come over here with English illustrations. But I'm a bit out of touch with things in this country, so you must forgive me. But years ago, there was a man called Charles Inwood, who was a great preacher, Methodist preacher, and he said, there is no such thing as a once and for all experience of the fullness of the Spirit of God. It is a moment-by-moment -moment appropriation of a moment-by-moment -moment supply from Jesus Christ himself. The moment I begin to believe, at that moment I begin to receive. And as long as I keep on believing, I keep on receiving. Now I think that's tremendous. It's very simple, but it's very biblical. You'll get it again on tape. <laughs> That will save me boring you with the repetition. The life of a person who is filled with the Spirit of God and who claims the experience may be imitated. But it can never be mistaken. There are many, many movements today which claim all kinds of experiences of the Holy Spirit which are not supported either from the Bible or from the lives of the people who claim them. By their fruit, Jesus said, you shall know them. But the effect of the life of a person, a man or girl, filled with the Spirit of God Indwelt by Christ will be unmistakably genuine. And I've just uh, put together in my mind about three things, that sounds fairly orthodox, three things that don't all begin with the same letter, that's not too good, um, that uh, will mark the reality of a spiritual life. And the first of these, which I, all of which I take from Ezekiel 47, the first of these is fruit. Let me ask you to look at that passage again at verse uh, 7. When I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Very many trees on the one side and on the other. Verse 12. And by the river upon the bank thereof, and this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his month because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary and the fruit thereof shall be for meat and the leaf thereof for medicine. The first evidence therefore of a spirit-filled life is fruit. And you notice that as the river has pursued its course it has attracted growth to its banks, very many trees. And the roots have dug in to the riverbed and draw constant strength from its water. Now here there's a fullness that never fades. 
And it doesn't disappear, or shouldn't, when youth gives way to age. All through the journey of life, there in God's mind is intended to be a constant freshness of soul. Unless the revelation which I claim to have had years ago can be supported by the experience of today, it's worthless. Absolutely worthless. The psalmist described it, as I quoted, I think, yesterday, in someone, like a tree, the godly man, planted by the river of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does, shall prosper. The Lord Jesus described that also. John 15, verse 16. I have come, and I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. No flash in the pan not simply an emotional experience, but a steady increasing fruitfulness displayed in a growing likeness to Christ. The Lord wants more than anything else from each of us a family likeness in all of his children. You see, the experience of the fullness of the Spirit, therefore, is a crisis followed by a process. I remember John Stott, of whom I'm sure you heard, speaking at the English Catholic Convention a few years ago and saying, beginning his message, when he was speaking to about, oh, 1,200 missionaries from all over the world. By the way, I hope you can get to Keswick sometime. You'd enjoy that. Come with all your waterproofs and umbrellas and ready for anything, but you will really enjoy the minister at Keswick. And um, as he spoke to these missionaries and began his message, he said, I want to speak to you about your greatest problem. <laughs> I saw 1,200 missionaries sit right up and end and say, only an Englishman could realize what they were saying, but I saw by the way they had their backs up, how does he know? <laughs> Nobody knows about my problem. We keep it to ourselves. <laughs> he said, your greatest problem is your fellow missionary. That was a bang. And it would be true of all of us that our greatest problem is often our fellow worker. He said, my answer, of course he elaborated considerably on it, treat every fellow missionary as though he was Jesus. React to every fellow missionary as though you were Jesus. That's it. That's it. Listen, it takes all the glory of Almighty God to bring His glory, His reality, into commonplace daily life. That there, there might be reflected a likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the fullness of the Holy Spirit is a crisis which opens the eyes of a Christian to a totally new plan of Christian living, <coughs> upon which he may live and in which Christ is everything. As by faith we appropriate that life then we can begin to apply it in every area. We are reconciled to God by His blood 
and we are saved by his life. Thank the Lord I have a share in his death and thank him even more that I have a share in his life. And the truth of the Spirit, of course, is in Galatians 5.22. You know it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Love, joy, peace, that's my relationship to the Lord. Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, that's my relationship with others. Faith, meekness, self-control. That's my relationship with myself. The fruit of the Spirit. And uh, that means that faith appropriates that life and begins to apply it in every detail of living. By that I very simply mean Jesus I may have said to you this already but it deserves an emphasis is exactly the opposite to everything that I am. And where we go so desperately wrong is trying to narrow the gap between the holiness of God and my sinfulness. And as long as we go on trying to do that, we end up drinking masses of coffee, taking pills, in the hands of a psychologist, or even a psychiatrist. And in the end, quite probably, a nervous breakdown. By trying to polish up the flesh, and refine it, and make it religious. I'm so thankful that I'm beginning to learn that it's not a natural tendency and I can easily revert at any time and I'm so often fearful that I do. But I'm beginning to learn when I'm almost on the point of blowing my top, top with someone, Lord Jesus, your patience right now, please. And when Satan comes at me with foul thoughts, Lord, your purity, thank you, I take it. Because it's always the opposite to everything that I am. And I have to day by day, moment by moment, feed my life on him and draw upon his power. His strength shows our best in weak people and made perfected, perfected in our weakness. How did Christ react? in that situation. How did he deal with that misunderstanding? So in every moment there is victory. As we learn deliberately to refuse to display ourselves and choose to reveal Jesus. As the old hymn says, moment by moment I have life from above. Moment by moment I am kept in his love. The fruit of the spirit-filled life. Many trees on one side and on the other. Is that happening in your life and in mine? It's only that kind of life that can be attractive and people are attracted not to you, but to Christ in you, and want an explanation. On my study wall, there's a calendar, and it has pictures of Scotland. And the one that I left behind at uh, the end of September, had a picture of one of these beautiful Scottish glens with a river just flowing through it and tumbling over a waterfall. And I thought to myself, what a lo lovely picture. 
of Ezekiel 47. Then I noticed that this picture was taken in wintertime. And uh, the trees were bare. The leaves were not there. So I suppose to myself that, well, it must be an imperfect picture because Ezekiel says, the leaf shall not fade. Oh, no. Where the tree is bare and of no sign of life, the barrenness of winter time is merely a preparation for spring and summer. Life is there, but it's gone underground. And that's an essential part of the growth in fruitfulness in the Christian life. Verse 12. It shall bring forth fruit according to his month. You know, if you reflect upon it, how true that is of Christian living. What do oh, you remember the early days after your conversion? Maybe the early years, I don't know. Well, everything has become new. Birds are singing, skies are blue, and uh, burdens have been lifted. At Calvary, springtime in my soul, time of great release and joy. Why, this Christian life is perpetual sunshine. But then comes autumn, or as you very appropriately call it, then comes the fall. <laughs> and the sterner lessons in the school of grace I learned then and the fall time and autumn time that's the time of stripping being laid bare signs of departing fruit until apparently winter is everywhere I wonder if you've all known the time in your life when it seems as if God had forsaken you and your ministry was stripped of every evidence of fruitfulness. A great experience, especially as if you've persuaded yourself, or some other stupid person has told you, that summertime is going to exist forever. But that happens, and it doesn't mean that everything's gone wrong. It's a principle of growth. You can bring greater glory to God in your spiritual winter than you can in your summer. For, it says verse 12, the leaf is for medicine, margin, for bruises and sores. And our ability as ministers of the Word of God, all of us in fact, to minister to a bruised, wounded life depends on whether or not I've learned the lessons of spiritual winter time in my own soul. In the book of Habakkuk, or um, Habakkuk, I don't know, depends what time the Atlantic it comes from. In the book of Habakkuk, <coughs> we read this as he closes though the fig tree shall not blossom neither shall fruit be in the vine the labor of the olive shall fail the fields shall yield no meat the flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stall yet yet I will rejoice in the Lord and joy in the God of my salvation. In other words, hallelujah anyway. <laughs> you know? I used to make a habit of saying that. And I thought I was so spiritual. Oh, everything's gone wrong. There's no sign of blessing and no sign of fruit, and I feel as dry as dust. Oh, hallelujah, anyway. 
And my dear son-in-law in heaven now said to me one day, Dad, you shouldn't say that. Whew, you know how you react to me today when you're ticked off by uh, another generation. <laughs> Why shouldn't I? I've been saying it before you were born. And he put his arm around me. <laughs> and he said, You should say, not hallelujah anyway, but hallelujah because. And I hugged him and said, Don, you're right. Not hallelujah, but anyway, but oh, thank the Lord because you've taught me what winter means. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Jesus, said, chapter 50, verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. I gave my back to the smiter, and my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. What a winter time. You know C.S. Lewis's book, Screwtape Letters? He had a way of satanic attack on this earth. There's a clear paragraph that reads, Be not deceived, Wormwood, right? Screwtape to his nephew. Our cause is never in danger, is never more in danger than when a human being no longer desiring, but still intending to do the enemy's will, the enemy of course being God, looks around him upon a universe from which every trace of his existence appears to have vanished, asks why he's been forsaking, but goes on obeying. Well, I think that's tremendous. Three tears in heaven, panic in hell. Satan has an answer to that. Have you learned your winter time? Or are you a summertime Christian? Only prepared to obey the Lord if he gives you lovely feelings. Nor can you face winter. Does your fruit remain? Does your leaf not fade? Fruit like that is the outcome of the flow of the river of life. The evidence of the supernatural. A few years ago I was um, in Kowloon, near Hong Kong, and uh, with uh, OMF, that was his missionary fellowship. And I was having a day with Philip Tang. He is the, the um, director of East Asia Theological Seminary. He took me out to the Chinese border. And there we looked right out into communist China, across the river, where so many people have sought to escape and have been killed. And he said to me, that's my country. Mm, yes, I know. He said, you know, the church today is twice as strong as when Chairman Mao took over. I said, you don't believe it. You don't mean it. Oh, yes, he said it is. And he said, I'll tell you something. There isn't a hypocrite left. Oh, my God, man. It took pressure, winter time, to clear out the hypocrite. said to me, when we get back to China, and they're back now, may I ask you something? You Westerners, please stay out. I said, why? He said, only Chinese people can evangelize China. We don't need you. We need you for teaching in Singapore, 
here in Hong Kong. We we'll need your funds. We we'll need your support. But when we go in, we've got to do the job. I hope we've learned the sense in the West of the tragic tragedy of trying to westernize a situation like that. It's impossible. Now, you know that there are more than nine million Christians in China. When the missionary was driven out in 1949-50, there certainly weren't more than a million. Nine million. And there's not a missionary among them. They're not the same, of course. They haven't all just been titled church building. They're all in house groups. And the church is alive. With the time. Lord teaches what winter time can do. Fourth. Now, dear me, hold it. <laughs> In the Christian life, that knows something of spiritual thought of the wholeness of the spirit. The wholeness of the spirit is given us for character. There are also gifts of the spirit, and they are given to us for service and ministry. Now, um, I don't want to get involved in controversy. Though, of course, I am leaving, as I said, you know, this meeting. <laughs> but, uh, oh, this is a terrible denial of what I've been saying. An awful advertisement of myself. But, if you want to know more, there's a book. It's just been published. And, um, uh, You'll find some things in it there which may be of help to you. But to me, one of the greatest tragedies today is the division that's been created by charismatic movement. Tragic. Because you understand that simply because we can do nothing apart from the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit upon whom Satan concentrates his attacks. And on that issue, he's got the whole church split everywhere. Yeah. A Christian, as you are. Caris, grace, magic, gifts. If I have no grace, and I have no gifts, I'm not even born again. So every Christian is charismatic from birth. And the only charismatic movement I know began at Pentecost. And it's been going rolling on ever since, and will continue. But uh, let me just say this to you. How may I put this? Um, you can discover the fullness of it in 1 Corinthians 12. have or may have and should have all the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 But you cannot have all the gifts of the Spirit. Never since Pentecost till today or until the coming of our Lord has there been anybody who has had all the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are distributed suddenly according to the will of God. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. In that chapter, there are 14 gifts mentioned. Concerning about pastors, or evangelists, fortunately there are some more gifts mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 12. About 19 of all in all, but you can't have the lot. What an extraordinary person you'd meet if he had everything. And therefore, it is utterly unbiblical to enforce one particular gift upon others. You've got to have my gift. 
if you want it. I remember after speaking at a meeting on this subject in London, a lady came up to me and said, what a pity you haven't got it. And I said, I beg your pardon, ma'am. And she said, what a pity you haven't got it. I said, what do you mean? Oh, if you only come to my church, we have it. All the gifts are in operation there. Come and get it. So I said to her, my dear lady, I'm not looking for it. I'm looking for him. Not the gift, but the giver. And I'm saying to them, Lord, I'm ready for any gift you will ever give me. I believe that all the gifts are available for the whole body everywhere. That in these last days the church may stand its ground against all the attacks of the enemy. Satan is attacking the church today, I think, more subtly than he ever has before. A few miles away from where I lived for the last 14 years at Cape and Rain, there was a church of Satan. And they were praying regularly for the collapse of Christian families. And they made a pretty good job of it. Satan is very powerful. And the Lord has equipped his church with all gifts. And I think it is absolutely unbiblical to say the gift of tongues, the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy are cancelled at Pentecost. How can we arbitrarily dismiss three of the gifts because we don't understand them? All the gifts are available for the whole church, but no one of the church can have them all. Some people whom I love very dearly, close to me, have received the gift of tongues. I would never know because they don't boast of it. They don't speak of it. The gift of tongues is for worship. And they worship the Lord that way. I wouldn't know unless I asked them. And they certainly never enforce it upon me. I presume they know that it takes me all my time to speak right with the one time I have got. <laughs> but I'm ready for it if the Lord wants to give it to me. It's not withdrawn, nor is the gift of healing, nor is the gift of prophecy. But I have no right to seek to enforce my gift on anyone else. That gift and all the gifts of the Spirit are given to every member of the church sovereignly in order that he may take his part in the body and contribute to the health of the whole body of Jesus. So will you just remember this in 1 Corinthians 12, which I hope you will read on your own. You can't be a loner if uh, the head, as Paul puts it, says to the foot, or the foot says to the head, seeing I'm only a foot, I'm no longer part of the body. How can you do that? They're all essential, all necessary all dependent of each other and when one member of the member of the body suffers we all suffer the body in action every member using the gift that God has given them for the glory of Jesus at our open the God meeting in England occasionally not often occasionally somebody will pray in a tongue audibly at once the minister stops the meeting and says an interpreter please and some of the interprets. Fine, everybody's perfectly happy. No fuss. But in some churches, in that, if that happened, they'd be turned out completely. And um, there'd be no fellowship. When will Christian people learn to disagree agreeably and not break fellowship? Why do we smash the body of Christ into, into shreds on secondary issues and fail really to unite and to love 
around the Lord Jesus. I'll say no more about that subject this morning. There isn't time. But that's enough, I hope, to give you food for little thought and for a further study on the subject of the gift. But with the fruit of the Spirit, which produces character, the Lord will give you the gifts that he knows you need in order that you may take the part he has for you in his body. I hope you'll get that. He will give you the gifts that he knows you need in order that you may take the part he has for you in his body. And I trust you will prove that in the future. Food. Gifts, very briefly, but healing too. Verse 8, These waters go down to the desert and go into the sea, and the waters shall be healed. As the river flowed down to the sea, it brought healing. What wonderful healing the Holy Spirit brings to the heart. The worst disorder of the soul, the unhappy estrangement in the family, the most damaging misunderstandings in the church, the bitterest feud in society can all be healed by the Holy Spirit, by His sweetness and by His fragrance. Oh, what the Spirit of God could do if only He was let loose and set free. The trouble is that when He begins to work and to operate, we set up a committee and we're afraid of Him and we'll say this church is getting too emotional and uh, we'd better do something about it. The Holy Spirit is grieved and withdraws. There's a hymn we used to sing, There is a balm in Gilead that makes the wounded whole. There's a balm in Gilead that heals the sin-sick soul. If I really believe that, that the Holy Spirit can heal deep down in my heart the disorder that's there, most psychiatrists would be put out of work. He heals. And wherever the Holy Spirit or the river comes, look in verse 9, there's life. Everything shall live where the river flows. That's the whole principle of Christian growth. The only sure method of growth. You can see it running right through in the Acts of the Apostles. Holy Spirit life in every fellowship. The church, the Lord, adding to the church day by day those whom he was saving life. Does that mean to say that uh, wherever a spirit-filled Christian goes, masses of people will be converted? No, no, it doesn't. It means masses of people stop being neutral. It means he's bringing life, the evidence of Christ, wherever he goes. And most of all, it means in his own heart, in his own life, in his own home, there's a renewed love to the Lord Jesus. There's more time given for his Bible, more time given for prayer. There's a greater burden for other people. There's less undisciplined habits, less waste of time. Where the Holy Spirit is producing life. Very many trees, verse 7, verse 9, a great multitude of fish 
everything that lives, which moves, whithersoever sh shall come, shall live. That's the answer of the Bible. Now, just one thing before I finish, to be very practical. <coughs> the result of a spirit-filled life, fruitfulness, healing, life. How may that be mine? Well, I've got to do a thorough job of repenting. That's a word that is almost a forgotten word in ministry today. To illustrate what I mean, for several years now, I have um, put this sheet of personal questions self-examination on the subject of repentance. I don't often take these into public, but you are, they become very dear to me. I would like you to, sh to share them with you. I'm not meaning to be introspective, but I'm meaning simply to be honest. Here they are. Am I either consciously or unconsciously, creating the impression that I am better than I really am? Is there the least suspicion of hypocrisy in my life? Am I scrupulously honest in all my words and acts? Do I exaggerate? Do I confidentially pass on to someone else what was told me in confidence? Am I reliable? Can I be trusted? Am I a slave to books, dress, friends, work, or convention? Am I still self-conscious? self-pitying or self-justifying? Is the Bible alive to me and do I give it time to speak to me every day? Am I enjoying my prayer life? Am I making contacts with other people and using them for the Lord? When did I last speak to another with the object of winning that person for Jesus? Am I getting to bed in turn and getting up in turn? Do I pray about the money I spend? Am I disobeying God in anything or insisting upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Jealous? Impure? Critical? irritable, touchy, or distrustful. How do I spend my spare time? Am I proud? Do I thank God that I am not as others, especially the Pharisee? Am I running away from life? Is Jesus real to me today? Is there anybody I dislike? disown, criticize, hold the resentment toward or disregard? If so, why? And what am I doing about it? Am I grumbling and complaining? Realizing that I am a single unit in an advancing army, I will surrender myself to the discipline of a soldier in active service. I welcome criticism from anybody else in the field and meet them regularly for prayer and frank discussion of progress and problems. If I see what is inconsistent, I think is inconsistent in another, 
I will first examine myself to see whether I also am inconsistent there. I refuse to discuss that person's weakness behind his back, and if I find myself doing so, I'll tell him and apologize. I'll pray for him, and if led to do so, I'll go and tell him. He'll be as grateful to me for that friendly act as I should be under similar circumstances. I will be absolutely loyal to my fellow worker. If I want to know the fullness of God's blessing in my life, there must be a thorough job of repenting. And then there must be implicit obedience. 99% obedience is the road to disaster. It must be 100%. Then there must be first. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, said Jesus. Do I want him? And then I must really ask him, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? Luke chapter 11. And finally, I must believe. He that believeth into me, out of his inner man shall flow rivers of living water. I close with this quotation from a hymn by A.B. Simpson, the founder of Christian Missionary Alliance. I take salvation full and free through him who gave his life for me. He undertakes my all to be. I take, he undertakes. I take the promised Holy Spirit. I take the power of Pentecost to fill me to the uttermost, I take, he undertakes. I simply take him at his word. I praise him that my prayer is heard and claim my answer from the Lord. I take, he undertakes. I take thee, blessed Lord. I give myself to thee and thou, according to thy word, does undertake for me. That's it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Just a moment of quiet prayer. simple and yet it goes down to the depths we want Lord that our lives should be fruitful that they know the inner healing of your spirit and that as we go from day to day in a part of your spirit everything may live Deliver us from dead orthodoxy. May we know the power of the river of the spirit of life. Thank you for being together. Thank you for what these days have meant to me. Fellowship and joy of it. Worship. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for... Dear Chuck, his wife, their vision, their ministry, have your hand upon them for good. First class target for the enemy. We surround him with our believing prayer. May with all of us, each one here today who has the responsibility of leadership, pastoral, church, and music, and everything, Lord Jesus, let this all stand together 
has a wonderful testimony to a risen Lord, the coming King. So it meant that his fellowship may just sweep his nation and then may come a mighty Holy Ghost revival. We ask this for your name and for your glory's sake. Amen. This is the end of side two and the end of this message. May the Lord richly bless you as you study his word. Please fast forward cassette to the end of this side so that the message will again begin on side one.